Anyways, welcome everybody. And um, I want to particularly in, uh, introduce and welcome our panelists. So I'm going to start with you, Trevor. Uh, Trevor Bodie is uh, an architect, writer, critic, and uh, and often a troublemaker. So at least uh, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> And then Matthew Thompson is a landscape uh, architect uh, in his uh, own practice. Uh, and uh, we enjoyed his time that he spent at uh, Dialogue some many moons ago. And then Shane Alexiak. And uh, Shane uh, has left us recently, but he was the uh, early instigator and planner for this residency. And given all the homework and uh, interest he's had in this, we thought it'd be a most appropriate uh, panelists to join us. So thanks all for being here. I'd like to welcome Jeff de Batista, who I'm seeing. I never know if he's from Toronto or Edmonton, but it's somewhere east of here. <laughs> and then um, two characters who are important and uh, were in attendance for a good part of this residency are Matt Parks and Neil Philipson. And they're from our uh, Calgary studio and the residency program heads to Calgary next. So uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, what I would do now is maybe turn over the mic to Doug McConnell and uh, introduce the residency program itself. Uh, thanks, Yos. So, so the residency is really at the heart of what Dialogue is, uh, is all about. Um, we built it to honor Tom Sutherland, who is a very special man in, in the uh, development of the idea of dialogue, our culture. And to honor Tom, we put together an idea of bringing eight to ten students together every year from uh, across Canada in the early years, North America now, and, uh, and we uh, give them an opportunity in the communities that we uh, live in to, to workshop an idea for Reading Week. And uh, it's meant to be an opportunity for them, an opportunity for the community, and a huge opportunity for dialogue to get infused by this awesome energy that we've seen here in Vancouver this week. So it really is at the heart of what we're all about, integration, youth, community. It's just very, very exciting. And I've had the privilege of watching this remarkable group work together. Awesome fun. With no further ado, I like being referred to as Madame. Okay, thank you so much for joining us all. And I would like to actually start off by giving a huge round of applause to these nine students for pulling this together. It's incredible. They work better than we do. We have a lot to learn. I've learned a lot. I know what integrated team means now. It's great. Um, and, and to that point, these are nine students from uh, a number of different disciplines from Western Canada and now the US. Um, and we're really excited to um, have them here to share their diversity of experiences and approaches to design through this residency. So my task is to describe what this design brief is all about. And um, I'm just gonna read, I know it's a bit of a faux pas. Um, but we've asked for these students to imagine a built intervention that can redefine the relationship that Vancouver's residents and visitors have with water and with each other. In what ways could shared experiences with swimming, bathing, saunas, or other ways of experiencing water be introduced to the vibrant civic life on Vancouver's English Bay Beach? How might an intervention impact the wider public understanding of the contemporary city dweller's place in the natural world? And so with those big questions, um, they have produced an amazing, provocative intervention in, in essentially 48 hours. And I am so pleased. And I guess I should give a little bit of an overview of what the week looked like for them. Tuesday, it's all about context. We toured the site. We um, overflowed their brains with um, uh, some perspectives from folks in the community to give context to uh, Vancouver's culture, to the culture on English Bay Beach. And then on Wednesday, we took them through some design exercises, uh, but then they really um, took 
took the bull by its horns, I think is the phrase, and went with it and um, yeah, produced what you'll see here all in the room. And um, yeah, so thank you. A uh, little bit of logistical stuff. There's going to be about a 30 minute presentation followed by around a 30 minute panel discussion. We'll open the conversation to all you guys and you guys. And for the folks in other studios, I guess I have to look in the camera for this. Um, if you have comments or questions, just type them in your little Zoom chat screen and um, we have someone here to um, take a look at what those questions are and relay them back to this broader audience. So without further ado, I think, I think that's the word for me. Okay, well, thank you everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Brittany Lopashinsky and I am a structural master's engineering student from the University of Alberta. And I have become a part of our larger team, which we have liked to name ourselves Team Seawalk. And we'll explain that as we go through our presentation. So as Emily um, kind of led into, we are a team of very diverse group people. Um, we have everything from mechanical and structural engineering to urban planning, um, interior design, architecture, landscape architecture. And it was really amazing to see us all, just a group of strangers on Tuesday, come together and really form a team and see what we could come up with. So the design brief we were given, as Emily mentioned, was about how we can change or reinvent the way that Vancouver and its guests view water and experience it here in the Vancouver area. So that got us really thinking after the presentations on how can we do this. And some themes, themes that kept coming to us were, how might we encourage healing through the celebration of water? How might we create identity through curiosity? and utilize the water as a medium for diminishing barriers and use it as a tool that we can interact with rather than it's something that we're just looking at. So in that, in finding these things that we wanted to look into, we had to kind of identify and make sure we were trying to get to solving a bit of a problem or identifying what we saw as problems in the Vancouver potential area. Um, social isolation is something that came up a lot. Vancouver has a lot of people, but yet they tend to feel isolated even when they're amongst each other. Vancouver has this difficulty of the sea, of the edge of the sea being where it likes to gather, but it's got the sea rise coming in and the city's trying to push out. So it's really putting a lot of pressure on the beaches. There's a runoff problem due to all the rain you guys get here and what that has to do to the environment of the beach and how it's affecting it. And a little bit of artificiality. Um, I'm from Edmonton. We don't have beaches like this unless you're at the lake. So we come here and we look and we don't really want to touch the water and how can we get guests and people are here to engage with the water in a new way. So um, this is a bit of a, some imagery of what we've been doing this past week. We had all kinds of storyboards, drawings, sketches. We had a pinup earlier this week and it really brought us from the idea of the pre-arrival research we had to do on saunas, pools, beaches, um, Vancouver's interaction currently with water and how we could bring that into a new and innovative way. Our group here, we have come with a uh, provocative, I guess, or dramatic change to what we could envision for the Vancouver area. And we're excited to share that with you today and see where it goes. So I'm going to hand it off to Gary and he'll give you more introduction. Great. Thank you very much, Brittany. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Baker and uh, I'm a landscape architect student here uh, at UBC in Vancouver. So what I'm going to do is give uh, you a little bit of context to our site, especially those of you that uh, are not familiar with uh, the site or indeed Vancouver. So this is an aerial shot of uh, a large portion of our city. And you can see there that the neon pink line is representing our seawall, which uh, approximates to about 28 kilometers, something that Vancouver is very, very proud of. The majority, if not all, of that seawall exists of a path with water on one side and then the urban form of a sort on the other. And it doesn't go out into the water at any point. Our site is the Yellow Eclipse uh, in the middle of that uh, illustration. And uh, Vancouver's uh, very famous, of course, for, for enjoying sunsets. And you can see that our site, in fact, faces that uh, sort of midsummer sunset. Zooming in, this is our site. You can see the large extent of the beach there, um, which is about uh, 500 meters in length uh, with uh, Stanley Park to the uh, left-hand side and Sunset Beach to the uh, right-hand side. 
I just want to speak to, to the um, significant issues that we were trying to address uh, within this site. Uh, which is illustrated on this particular diagram. The black line is really identifying the edge to the north end is really the edge of the park uh, to the west end neighborhood and the southern edge is at the water's edge. The other key element here is the amount of traffic that passes through this site. You can see the red lines are the two-way traffic and the orange just one way coming out of Stanley Park in the bottom left hand corner. This is actually a site that a lot of people speed through. I will say that living in Vancouver, I am guilty of that myself. Uh, if I'm coming off the Lionsgate Bridge, then I like to come down through Stanley Park and along the West End edge. Uh, but it really is a road that dissects this local neighborhood uh, from the water's edge and from uh, the beach and the ocean. So our proposal in changing those two things is really keeping that northern edge the same as it currently is, but really softening the southern edge, as you can see from the black dotted line. The other major move that we are uh, making here is that we are taking away the circulation, the traffic from this edge. Uh, it's to be diverted, either recycled back through Stanley Park and out to Georgia Street or uh, locally through Denman and Davy Street, which you can see as the red arrows. Um, and this is really important to us to actually free up this site and effectively give the beach and the water back to the, the West End community. The two orange dots here are really identifying our key points of arrival. The other key theme that we were thinking about in terms of the transit for the future is um, employing a new trolley system that would go out along the West End uh, site on the, uh, on the, uh, the right hand side of uh, the illustration here. One of the key themes that we talked about really was uh, talking about um, gradients and gradients in different forms across our site, both at the macro and the micro level. Um, either that being thinking about those that like to spend time on their own as introverts in a place or those that like to be far more active as extroverts and thinking about the spectrum from the forest experience to the city experience. And you will see and hear references to this throughout the description of our site going forward. At this point, I will let Jesse take over. Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Jesse. I'm a civil engineering student at the University of Victoria. Um, so here we kind of have our current model in cities is normally cars prioritize, then traffic has to detour a little bit more, and then people detour even more. With our site redesign, we're proposing to switch that completely, where people are the priority on the site, traffic enters into the arrival points and makes access easier that way, and then cars are redirected around. If they want to come to the beach, they have to detour around and get to the site um, by not just passing through, by actively enjoying. So this is now our proposed new site plan. At the top edge of the site, we're taking back the roadways. We're taking back that public space for the people, creating a plaza system linearly um, on the already hard paved areas and incorporating those with the arrival points. From the plaza system, which is the net louder, more social introverted side of the gradient, you're adding in this redesigned beach space as all public gathering space, providing possibly a public square type environment for Vancouver and the West End. Um, at this end of the space as well, you have a potential new site location for a reimagined Vancouver Aquatic Center, which is a uh, potential for site proposed site that the Parks Board could explore as they move forward with that, um, that aquatic center plan. And that's in the louder side. As we move this way, we move into a more marshland environment, more naturalized um, freshwater marshes and uh, salt marshes. And overlaying that, we have uh, integrated wellness and wellness centers and circulation that you'll hear more about from the rest of the team. Um, moving outwards in the site, uh, you're getting like the the um, you're getting out into the water and you're approaching this new reimagined seawall that is no longer seawall 
it's a sea walk. You're over the ocean, you're in the ocean. You're with the ocean and it, the ocean can pass through. It's porous, it's soft, it allows water to pass through into our new environment that I will pass over for you to hear more about. Just while it's up, the little and high tide labels are incorrect. I just noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> the detail. <laughs> the ocean won't come back with it. It's easy enough. I talk about it and then I can't remember. Awesome. <laughs> well. Um, I'm here to talk, sorry, my name is Felix Torres and I'm from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. And I wanted to speak a little bit more to how the uh, design functions. Uh, the red lines that are coming down through the site represent vehicular, vehicular traffic and the light blue lines, which can't be seen really well, but follow the red lines as well. That's uh, stormwater runoff. Uh, that water carries pollutants, um, and in its previous condition, those pollutants made it to the sea and uh, degrade that environment, uh, so made it less effective for uh, human use. Um, and our whole proposal addresses that issue. Um, and in addressing that issue, uh, we thought about um, water as being a key element and to begin we wanted to invite water onto the site um, through the same paths that we invite people through the site. Um, water uh, would travel through uh, down through this area on the plazas that we were proposing those would be covered with a new permeable surface. Uh, below that would be cisterns and then the water would take a journey through this um, integration area and this habitat area and the regeneration area. And part of that journey um, is cleansing the water, but also letting um, the water uh, integrate and mix uh, the city uh, with the ocean um, as it cleans um, in that process, creating habitat for humans and for nature as well as exploring opportunities for new technologies, um, like uh, creating possibly electricity through the movement of water and other technologies that rely more on natural systems, like having clams or oysters for further purification of the water. Uh, thank you. Oh my God, I, I talk with my hands too much to use a microphone. This shouldn't be allowed. Um, okay, hi, I'm Sydney. I'm an interior design student from KPU and I'm here to talk to you guys about pathways. Um, so these are our proposed pathways for the site. Um, not to say that the seawall in place right now isn't beautiful. I'm sure people run along it. If you run along it, good for you, you run, congratulations. Um, um, but we're not taking that away. We're just adding more opportunities for it to be better than it ever, we ever could have imagined it was, especially at the beginning of this week. Um, so this is our site that a few of our friends went over before. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking to you about in a, this. I'm going to point the laser pointer, but I think it's a bad choice with my hands and how shaky they are. Um, but there you go. I'm going to be focusing mostly on these pathways through the marshlands here. Um, so at high tide, half of these little pathways and things will be revealed and at low or at high tide, pathways will be hidden and then at low tide they will be revealed. It was me that made the high and low tide mistake before. I beg of your forgiveness. <laughs> um, so right now we've kind of identified two main problems with our Vancouver seawall. One, as in it is completely over capacity. Um, you may have known that if you're running and then a woman stops to pick up her dog's poop in the bike lane and then you run into her and then it starts a whole traffic accident on the seawall. Um, in addition to that, um, Vancouver views its landscapes very much as this picture that we view in the background of our lives. Um, it's not something that we directly interact with. We kind of look at it as, at, at it as this thing in the distance, this beautiful like these mountain sceneries, almost kind of becoming this stagnant picture on our wall. Um, so the idea with this was to kind of encourage the sense of further interaction with our seawall to get people interacting with the systems and the processes and all the things that really make that how we view that very stagnant nature, how to kind of find beauty in those smaller processes in like finding in like a lily pad, in finding a, a heron eating a frog on that lily pad, just 
kind of allowing for a deeper integration and appreciation for the nature that we already love so much in Vancouver. Um, so speaking to that a little bit, um, in our pathway systems, we really wanted to ampl amplify those connections. So in creating this kind of playful um, idea of how these pathways are going, so we'll still have our main routes going along the seawall, or seawalk as we're now calling it, because it's not exactly a wall. Um, <laughs> Um, so kind of like dropping people down and bringing them into these processes or allowing people to kind of some pathways to disappear and some to appear with high and low tides. So you're kind of understanding how these things work by only allowed to well, only being allowed to be on them at certain times. Um, in addition to this, we thought the idea of like childhood mentorship was a very important thing in encouraging connections to the environment. I know when I was a kid, I grew up in Steveston, which Sorry to the people in the camera. You don't know where that is. There's, there's ditches, there's frogs. Um, and I know a lot of my appreciation from nature really came from that appreciation of being able to like, catch a frog and then see a tadpole like grow legs and understand how those processes all came to be. Um, so really encouraging play in these scenarios and allowing parents to sit back and let their kids like look into the water and try to catch a frog with a net or um, in the picture illustrated at the bottom, kind of being able to like jump on these little levered systems. So you're like jumping on a lily pad like a frog um, and kind of just harnessing that deeper connection to nature for everybody in Vancouver, which is a very adult oriented city in many cases. Um, moving into how we're going to experience that play on the seawalk that we're going to talk about a little bit further in one minute um, is kind of this like tiered system so further appreciation that rise and low of the tides and like kind of bringing back that uh, landscape that Vancouver had before we dumped a bunch of sand on the beaches um, kind of bringing back those tide pools and making these kind of more manufactured tide pools to allow that further integration with nature um, and given that I'm an interior designer so I don't know how it works so I'm going to pass it off to an engineer <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for the drawings. I am an engineer. <laughs> uh, but uh, my name is Mahan Lamont. I'm a mechanical engineering student from University of Victoria. Um, don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm trying my best. Um, so this is the seawalk that we are talking about. Um, the big difference between the seawalk and the seawall is we're eliminating that hard edge of uh, that the current seawall provides. So instead of it being this rigid structure that's meant to hold backwater, we're actually um, implementing these holes that you can see um, on the top right with some guys standing on it. Um, they let water flow through, so it restricts it. So it actually slows down the tidal movement. So um, there will be times uh, as the tide's changing where one side of the wall, it'll be quite a few quite a bit higher and then on the other it'll be lower and that'll change throughout the day. Um, I like energy, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm like, oh, let's put some uh, tidal energy in there. So those are propellers. Um, hopefully they won't cut up the fish, but we'll figure that out later. Um, to uh, figure out, yeah, <laughs> it's fine, they're good. <laughs> we'll redesign the fish. Uh, um, so we are talking about this whole introvert, introvert to extrovert um, spectrum or gradient. I like spectrum and there's, it's more of a, I don't know, I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> so uh, starting on the left there, we've got our introversion. Um, so I kinda, or sorry, not I, we, I'm again, selfish. Um, <laughs> uh, we were looking at our Pacific coast. So uh, one thing you'll see when you go out to the beaches on Western Vancouver Island is you have these layer, uh, these levels, and they're actually defined levels, especially when the t tide is quite variable. Um, so there will actually be these three meter long wide pathways at different heights and you can walk along them. So the whole idea is that you can walk on these levels and depending on how much tide there is, um, this area will change. So when the tide's up, it's a lot more confined and when the tide's out, you can go out, hang out, it's a bit more of a communal area. Um, and then moving to the right, um, there's some inspiration from tidal pools. This is Botanical Beach, which is again Vancouver Island. I'm from there, I live there, so I'm just throwing it in there. Um, you should visit. Um, so, so we got some tidal pools, uh, same sort of thing. There's a staggered um, movement. There's still the tidal energy if you want it. And there's these tunnels you can walk through. Um, and yeah. 
And then moving on to the introvert, our extrovert, not introvert, um, we have this playful area. So this is this rigid line, um, and we have these holes. Instead of letting the water flow through like a pipe, um, we're actually treating them like water spouts. So as the waves come in, the water will be shooting out, and you can get splashed. Um, again, not sure about the safety of it, but we'll figure that out. Um, and at low tide, you can slide down them like a water slide and play around with that. Um, yeah, and taking inspiration from water spouts. And then this is some idiot in Lynn Canyon um, <laughs> who's going to get picked up. And there's these whole levels that we're talking about are kind of connected with this very heavily math-based uh, ramp system. But um, yeah, they're just ramps. That's all they are. And uh, I'll pass it on um, to talk about the, what it connects to, which is a bridge. So that brings it back to me. I feel quite in the same boat with this whole engineering thing. It was a very different uh, week for us, but um, putting in a structure like a bridge makes sense to me. <laughs> um, so in order to make sure that the sea walk is a complete immersing idea of you going from the land out to the sea and back to the land, we wanted to keep the views so a bridge we thought would be a good way to do that. So from sitting on the beach at low tide, you'll be able to see through the bridge and into the further background. And at high tide, we're imagining that the water comes right to the edge of the bridge. And if someone's out there walking, it could look like they're walking on water. So really immersing them with the environment and the bridge is the way to bring you back to the land and back to the um, extroverted side of the beach. Um, so really encapsulating it and um, going from there. The other thing that this bridge does is it brings us back to the land where you can interact and deal with the pod system, which we keep referring to. You guys are probably confused about these pods. Um, our next group that has been working on it all week um, has done a really good job and they're gonna let you know about what these pods actually entail. Good afternoon, my name is Ryan and I'm from University of Calgary in my last semester of Master of Architecture program. Um, today, when many parts of the world are facing the issue of climate crisis, Vancouver also faces a new type of issue, gentrification. Waterways becomes the playgrounds of the privileged when others are limited to the edge of the cities, seeing water as a barrier. Therefore, we aim to um, improve the connection, social and environmental connections by using water as a medium to diminish the barrier. Rather than proposing a single standalone sauna bathing house on the seashore looking towards the mountains, we're proposing a constellation of floating sauna networks, a new sauna bathing house typology. Some of these uh, bath house also been washed up to the seashores to integrate the newly designed landscape and also inviting the public. Therefore, creating a gradient from the most introverted, a linear journey to the more uh, introverted, this dispersed form for pleasure of discovery. During the high and low tide, these pods can appear to be either floating or washed off. Depends on different occupancies, these pods can be either fully buoyant or uh, submerged. Each individual of these pods offer an element of surprise. Firstly, through the interiors, intimate interior space to contrast with the vast ocean outside. Then through relationship with the waters that is unique each time. There's hot pools, there's cold pools where you can take a plunge at eight degrees. There's pools that are filled with mist and fog that responds to the Vancouver's climate and weather. From pods, one pod to another, the visitors invent their own itineraries. In this, uh, and there are also pods uh, that are filled with seaweed where you can taste the water. There's also pods that harvest the floating garbages where appears to be too dirty to go in. So overall, all these pots are filled with atmospheres and presence, uh, surrounded with specific materials. With the shell of these pots becomes an instrument that brings people together.
So I'm Benjamin and I'm an architecture student from the Academy of Art University. And so showing the pods before there was a gradient from extroverted to introverted. Um, so our extroverted point with the pods lands directly in an introverted area of the site overall. Um, so we were looking to really make a bold statement with that extrovert and kind of make a juxtaposition um, of the environment and of the both natural environment and the kind of um, experiential environment there as well. Um, so we looked at creating a kind of large sculptural form that uh, opens up and orientates towards the other, other pods that are kind of bubbling along in the ocean and the rest of the site. And with that, we kind of look to bring that fun in, um, not just within the like public bath and sauna type area that we were having, uh, but also with the building form itself. So we kind of thought of it as a bubble cannon shooting those pods out into the ocean to kind of show um, just the fun side to the site as well. Um, and yeah, with that, we're just looking at creating a more public experience as well um, for more group gathering. And then later on, as you move through to the more individual pods, there's more of a intimate and more personal experience. And I also made a model because I'm an architecture student. So I'll pass it around and you can look. Hi, my name is Jean Rowe, and I'm a, a master's in planning student at U UBC. Um, so, yes, we've been talking about these pods and this journey out into the ocean. Um, and we've also been talking about um, our general theme of healing. And we've, we've taken you through the scale of the ecological to the urban, to the public and social, um, to the built form. And now we're into the interior scale as well as the the individual scale of healing. So um, we have, an, we have um, this idea that as you go out into the pods, they become um, more introverted because we also have that theme of the gradient between extroverted and introverted. And there's themes of exploration um, and awareness where maybe you see out there some, some garbage and seaweed and you have more of a an, an understanding of the environment that lifts goes on below the surface of the postcard picture that is the Vancouver landscape often. Um, and then there's also this element of relaxation. We did a lot of research beforehand about bathhouses, um, hammams, saunas, um, sweat lodges. So we wanted to, to bring some of that in. So there's, yes, there's, there's this is kind of a, a sauna that changes, the experience changes at, at time of day and at, at the level of tide. And then um, far out into the most, the most introverted space, we have um, imagined areas of more individual contemplation that this is the same, same spot, but changes with the, with the weather as well as the tides. Um, here, imagine it's a little floating candle in the water. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, yeah, overall we have um, thought that ecological, urban and so social and personal healing through the celebration of water. So now I'll pass it on to Gary. Oh, sorry. No I worries. switched the slide for you. That's okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. So me again. And um, if nothing else, as it relates to our proposal, we'd like to ensure that there would be a lot of fun had on this site. And again, for those of you that have visited, I am pretty sure that this sits somewhere in your social media feed. And uh, if you don't like anything uh, of what we've proposed, then at, at least we had an idea that you might take these statues and put them somewhere else, especially as it relates to the, uh, the tidal changes in Vancouver and in English Bay, such that, huh. Oh my word, the tag, tagline's gone. Well, I'm gonna keep going. Well, we do, but it's, you know what? We're going we're gonna to let you hold out. We're going to deliver it perhaps in a little while to you. But ideally what we would be doing, in fact, is taking this chap here and maybe each, each of these 
and putting them in the water here so that if nothing else, if you can imagine this in your minds as designers, I'm sure you can, that as the tide comes in, that he gradually disappears below the water. Um, so uh, just to close, uh, thank you for uh, listening and being attentive to our proposal today. And we'd especially as a team like to thank the, the dialogue team in hosting us. It's been an absolute incredible experience for each of us. IT. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'll submit an IT ticket for the missing slide. Um, thank you so much. Another big round of applause for the student group. Um, yeah, it was really awesome. I'm really impressed, you guys. Um, and now I can turn it over to the panelists. Yeah, so you can sit in the chairs if you'd like. <laughs> you missed the you missed the <laughs> stairs. Oh, you missed the stairs. Okay, yeah. And maybe what we could do is you could each deliver one short little sentiment about the project in general and then open it up to larger remarks. Does that sound fair? Okay. And then I'll, um, well, I'll, I'll broaden up the conversation. Um, well, wait a minute. You, guys, you, need, you need this. You are a CWOX? You need that. Oh, you do. For, yeah. for the studio. Um, you call yourself CWOX team? So, ever play Star Wars character CWOX? Okay. Yeah. The one that didn't make it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, e Ewoks pushed their way in. Okay. Um, what I like about what you showed us is really the first couple images and the last. Can we go right back to the first image? Can someone cue that up? The last images, while well, they're fresh in mind, were really quite wonderful. They're true bubble diagrams. They are bubbles, but they're uh, beautiful. The background's really evocative, and they're, they capture the, the essence. I, I'm really moved by those. And then right back to the very first uh, urban plan. Just while we're looking for this, I did, I'll say something brief about Tom Sutherland. Um, I'm from Alberta and knew him from student days on. And uh, Jeremy Sturgis and I organized the architecture lecture series for Calgary. And I, I brought some of my former teachers, Graham Coolhouse and, and uh, Charles Moore there. So we started talking back then and um, a new one through various uh, incarnations. I think the last time I saw him, they invited me to dialogue for a crit. They actually flew me out from Vancouver and we, uh, actual projects were pinned up and we spent a day. And of course, the young architects really liked it because, you know, they've been sitting at screens, et cetera, and they missed the, the chemistry of, of crit in school. So anyway, um, hats off to the memory of, of Tom and, and good on dialogue for doing this. Okay, um, could you go to the next one where it actually shows the block plan a bit more? Uh, uh, keep going. Are you talking about our site once we've yeah. everything? Just, just uh, yeah, with circulation and, um, yeah, that, that, that's great. Okay, um, I think you're onto something really, really quite interesting here. This is, uh, is a space, you've got it. You capture the notion that it doesn't really work as an automobile space. It's, uh, vehicles are at a crawl there, uh, and, they're, and they're almost stopped on a summer day. So it really is dysfunctional as a conventional uh, machine movement street, that part of the avenue. So I think the notion of saying get lost is a really powerful idea. And diverting the traffic, if need be, back into the neighborhood. And Vancouver's got this huge ace up the sleeve called the lanes. We've got huge potential removing vehicles <clears throat> and every block. So the notion that you've got to give over your most precious uh, waterfront to uh, car, car movement, uh, you're absolutely spot on. And I, I, it's amazing, this diagram shows how much public space you could capture. You know what I mean? It really is, you, you tripled or doubled at least the functional public space down there in a very important place. Uh, I really like the fact that you murdered the, the gathering of uh, plastic uh, happy people. Uh, I, I hope they've been put out to sea or deep six or something. Uh, later, if anyone wants the background story why they're there, I'll tell you. 
Um, the gazebo is still there. You didn't get rid of it. Is it in the park on the right? You know. Okay, no, you can move it. Yeah, the gazebo will move. Now, just to clarify a bit, then I'll hand this on to my, my colleagues. We'll do other rounds. But uh, the pods, <clears throat> the pods are movable, semi-movable, fixed, and a lot of the kind of walkway stuff we saw is a different proposal. Just kind of clarify a little bit uh, of what those pods are and reconcile it a little bit with the sections of C, uh, not seawalk, it's not seawall, seawalk. Just, just explain a little bit. I'm, there may be two different ideas. I just need to clarify. Um, I guess the idea of kind of the way we had broken up our thoughts this whole week was that we had this huge idea of completely changing where traffic was, but we also had to think about how we were going to change how the people move, but still wanting to keep in this idea of wellness and how we could offer that. So the pods and kind of discussions, some of them would be permanent and the walkways would be bridge-like between here and here that would be able to be walked under at low tide. Um, they would change, these ones may be floating, honestly, some of it wasn't flushed out in terms of where the locations of the pods would be, but the idea that our circulation would work around the pods and bringing people. And yeah, just to confirm there, it was all one proposal. So this, the pathways that you saw would be either along here or also to help get to the pods, if that makes sense. I had something to add with this path. Um, the intentional idea with the path was to have it permeable. That's what these arrows represent. We didn't develop the, the walk as much as we did some of the other ideas. We figured that this spoke strongly on its own. And we included different options for how the path could function. But um, the vision for the walk is still a work in progress. It could have level changes. It was just more um, a big picture idea to be de um, developed later. Uh, but it should have functioned um, as part of a system. So collecting water on these plazas, bringing that fresh water into a marsh, um, having that marsh uh, interact with the ocean. Um, and that water is coming from this area. So creating a functional environment that also could generate energy um, with the movement of tides was kind of the bigger picture concept that led to a lot of these ideas. Um, and increasing the capacity of the entire space while conserving areas that um, still spoke to how the site was histor is historically used or was hist is currently used. Um, keeping that beach for a lot of the traditional events. Those were the types of ideas, just the fluidity and breaking all these different barriers and integrating the city to um, function in a more complete way. Okay, last comment. Uh, too much of, oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, last comment is too much of a good idea. Uh, the good idea is to get people walking above the water somehow. Uh, you have a whole different existential relationship to water if you're looking down on it or above it or looking it into maybe fish or floating plastic or whatever it is. But looking down is very important. And, uh, you know, uh, the glacier skywalk that Jeremy did in Banff Park, the glass bottom walk. People go out there and they, you have a staunch relationship to a valley, uh, to height, altitude. You don't get uh, any other way. And, and I do think it's a good idea. So it's too much of a good idea. I don't think you needed the full Walker's Freeway uh, all the way through the long blue line of all of that. I think you could have strategically uh, found a spot or two for it. And I love it because it's so bad. It's so non-Vancouver. In a thousand years, no Vancouver authority would ever allow anyone to stand and look above the water in a place like that. And I like the fact that you guys have caught on to that. So good idea. But with a good idea, sometimes you have to know how to deploy it strategically where, where it matters and not extend it into, into infra, uh, long term, long multi block scale infrastructure. I'll pass on. 
Wow, guys. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very, very happy and very, very impressed at what you guys have put together here. Um, one of my greatest regrets of leading dialogue is that I was going to be unable to participate in this. So I, uh, um, I, was, I left it in very good hands, as it turns out. So congratulations to sort of Emily and Jason for um, steering. And Nick, Nick got involved as well. Fabulous. Okay, well, well done for that. Um, I'm so happy. Um, the, uh, the, I, I witnessed the Toronto week last year, so I have a reasonably good idea of the, the process that you guys went through, and I know it wasn't an easy one. You sort of, you show up and it's, you kind of have to hit the ground running. Um, I think you did a very good job of just starting to design. Um, you addressed a lot of things. I'm glad you kind of ignored a lot of rules and permissions that may or may not be allowed. Perhaps you were sort of unburdened by the, uh, you know, having spent a lot of time in Vancouver. Um, you, you're, you're, you're able to bring a perspective to it that ignored streets that people are going to be precious about and cars and things like that, that get in the way, parking, you know, important things to uh, the city and arguably not that important to a place like this. So, um, and I mean the city hall, less so the operations of the city. So yeah, very well done there. Um, I don't know exactly how the brief may have changed in, since I left, but um, I'm not sure if there was an, uh, an aquatic center added to the brief, but I love that you included that. Um, I think you guys, you sort of, you pushed the edges of the thing. Um, I do think it would be like a wonderful place for like a remake of that scene in Free Willy. You know, like, <laughs> right right over the sea walk would be kind of perfect um so maybe maybe another rendering of that um uh yeah i'm very curious about the sort of cliffhanger ending that you left us with there very well done great great theater in that um yeah no i think it's it's the kind of uh disruptive ambitious idea that i was hoping this you know a group like this would come up with so well done I'm not sure how much time we have. I know there's a whole other kind of panel sitting behind us here. I, I actually don't know how I'm here, <laughs> um, but I'm glad to be here. I got to see you. I'm glad my fob still works. That was good. So, uh, um, I, I understand how these processes go, and I guess I wanted to just challenge a little bit the brief. I mean, what I heard there's a whole bunch of really interesting stuff, but designing a built intervention, really. Okay. Because um, I actually think, I mean, that's tricky. It's often tricky to get a challenge. Is first of all, say, okay, is the ladder really up the right wall before we all kind of climb up there? What really I enjoyed was actually the reductive nature of the explorations, the challenge you did on what already is the built intervention, the, the, the hard line of this of this natural. Like, like it's in our world, we we like to think water is wet when wetness is really all around us. So it's kind of interesting to that you can kind of tackle that. Um, I like there was some kind of iconography starting to kind of come out of those holes you're kind of pulling out. And so it's almost like sedimentation, you know, breaking that apart and that started to maybe start to inform your additive process. But I guess it was just a little bit of challenging as designers, we often kind of credit ourselves and define ourselves by putting more stuff into the world. And, and I actually think, you know, in this objectified world we live in, if we start to look at the systems, the natural systems in particular, but are ephemeral systems and so i'd have loved to have seen uh, you had a great diagram of obviously the larger vancouver and the seawall and i'd love to see some of the more systemic diagrams just beyond this picture to start to kind of educate and inform the context and you know us as these kind of beings within an ecosystem so um the piano thing that the the, <laughs> the swimming pool uh that yeah i that that it just is a bit of a bit of an elephant in the room there but um yeah great, great job at just again working obviously as a team which i know is challenging multidisciplinary um so i really credit you for doing that really interesting ideas it's also a challenge to, to put pen to paper and actually manifest them to actually make them look like things but you've done a great job at teasing us with that i guess we'll turn it over to you guys are there any questions from there's another que there's questions from another studio, so I'm going to get Nick to share that. So we have a question 
here from Calgary. It's it's a bit long, so I'll try to read it quickly. It says, hi all, uh, Jody, James, and Matthew Parker here from Calgary. Thanks for the presentation, lots of compelling thoughts. We really appreciate how the idea of flux was a significant driver for the team. The focus seems somewhat constrained to a 24 hour period of time, but what if we start to think about change at a different scale? What is the site in, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 years or more interesting in 100 years when rising sea levels completely absorb the coastline? We'd love to hear your thoughts on how this intervention could be reconceived for this broader, temp broader temporal scale. Um, yeah, I guess we had really thought about like how the tides and everything would affect it. Um, but I think another maybe not vocalized thought on that was that maybe like if you don't do anything about it you don't get your walkway anymore you don't get to do that stuff so it's like always the threat of not having the possibility of having that and having pathways closed off maybe like in the built environment and literally like it kind of double edges it there it's it, it's almost like a threat if you don't fix up your environment and don't address these issues um you're not going to get your nice bridges that we made for you <laughs> so i don't know if that answered your question yeah, no, I'll just add another piece as well. Our thoughts were that um, the seawall, at least at the moment, is a little bit of a barrier, but we might recognize that it's not a tough enough barrier or a tall enough barrier. So we did think that the edge of our plaza area, this brown dotted line, would actually be a little more reinforced and a little taller, so that at least could help with combating sea level rise at those stages too. Also, we did no calculations this week, so no way to know what's really going on. <laughs> Actually, could we just uh, expand on that very last idea of Brittany's for a minute? Could I, could I just have maybe Brittany and Cindy, um, Sydney, as an interior designer and a structural engineer, talk a little bit about spending some days working together thinking like you have done because I think that's as much learning as the thinking through the design problem. Um, okay, I, I guess I'll start. Um, for me, this was probably the most active my brain has been in a while. Not saying that school isn't engaging, but my brain was worked in a completely different way. The fact that I sent Emily an email and I was like, do I need to know about steel design, masonry? Do I have to be brushed up on my seismic design? I had no idea what to expect and uh, came here and didn't write a single number other than on a list of what we had to do. So um, for me, it was really about learning about the creative process and how much effort and energy that takes. And it's um, super interesting to work with this group of people whose minds work that way and listen. And um, they talked about kind of the freedom of uh, one of the guest speakers spoke about the freedom of, oh, we didn't have rules. I always had those rules in my head of, we can't just get rid of the road. What about, why can't, we can't do that, or how is it going to work? And this group really um, opened my mind to saying, well, let's not worry about it yet. We're not at the stage of engineering it to make it work. It's just about a, an idea. Okay. Um, I think, like, as an interior design student, I feel, like, a little bit of the need, at least, to, like, know a bit of my stuff. So I don't feel like I'm kind of like falling or drowning like the architecture world so I kind of like I'm like hey I can talk about that too but like on that same thread like even understanding the like language difference in how we talk we were saying worlds like ephemeral and she was like huh <laughs> 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 we're like oh like soften the barrier like make it more vulnerable and she's like <laughs> How does that work with the engineering of this <laughs> like i think it was more than just like how we were like the ways in which we think but it was just the ways in we which we communicate that i really felt like a thing that i had never thought about in this week and so it's neat to know do you know what a party diagram is now <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Any more last uh, comments, questions from either here or afar? Actually, will you say it and we'll repeat it after. No, we won't. We'll re I'll repeat it after. <laughs> I'll repeat it after. Okay, you can go. <laughs> uh, thanks. 
I think just a quick comment to echo something that was brought up in the beginning is about an integrated team. I think you said it, that we had a lot to learn from that process. And I, I think that's like actually accurate. And it's not because we're bad people in the office and we don't like talking to each other, but it's actually really hard. And I think in terms of the future and these global issues like climate change, we absolutely need new people uh, to get together and integrate and communicate in new ways exactly like that. So I just encourage you to keep doing it and don't think of yourself as a siloed professional, I guess. I don't know if we have time for this, but I was going to ask the team, when this gets built, what is your favorite spot? Um, I might be biased because I worked a lot on the pods, but um, <laughs> my, um, I really enjoy the like experiential kind of part of it. And that's really what we try to force with the pods is to have different experiences with the ocean and and the site as well so it wasn't just let's go and sit in a hot tub it was maybe how does that sitting there and like impact then the uh, way the pods sit in the water how does that show the impact of like rising water or the tides or the power of like the water even the rain and the sound and just different experiences and you're not just experiencing the water in kind of your typical way of just going to the beach, going in the water and coming home. Anyways, I'm going to take uh, liberties. I know there's maybe one or two other voices, but uh, I'm being respectful of my friends in Toronto where it's 10 after five at the moment. And it's also amazing that we can be here sharing your ideas right across this country. And uh, I would say I was impressed. Um, what, what I um, found really um, provocative was, uh, and I think we're in an era of needing to be regenerative and rethinking many things. And uh, so your ability to arrive in this town and generate thinking like this, I think is really timely. Um, I found out, I, I was interested in the streetcar idea. Well, it turns out there's already a plan that's been in place a long time that takes a streetcar along Denman and Davey, like there's systemic thinking that this city already has done into which this can easily plug. I also really appreciated being able to simultaneously think of macro systems to individual personal experience and weave that all together. So I say thank you. And I say thank you for all of you having signed up and taken on this adventure. Uh, I think we learn a lot through these processes. Um, there was also an enormous support team who made this all possible. And uh, I would start uh, with Doug McConnell, who uh, instigated this residency and uh, continues it on a, on a good course. So, And then my list of characters, including <laughs> Emily, and, and a belated thanks to our other friend. Um, jo and jo <laughs> That's about as intimate as I can get with this guy now. <laughs> Anyways, um, Jeff Bonin, who, who isn't here, but who orchestrated all the logistics of hotel rooms, meals. Uh, there was a lot of logistics that go into a thing uh, like this. Uh, Nicholas and Jason, uh, they were incredible cheerleaders and supporters through this whole process. I'm not sure if Nicholas was paying her attention or just whether he lodged in his photo lens. I'm not sure, but... Uh, <laughs> And uh, Charmy, uh, no, Alex, Alex Heinen involved uh, in day-to-day -day details of organizing things, which is important. Uh, and Charmy, I think she was a food coordinator. And I, I, at least I managed to have a substantial lunch every day, which was good. And then uh, Henry sitting there quietly orchestrating us and being able to communicate across our studios. And up above is Derek Lapierre, who also assisted so and I thank all of the studio for being gracious to our visitors and uh, so thank you everybody and since nobody else is gonna thank Yoast um, who was wonderfully provocative and capable as we would expect from Yoast but whose biggest contribution was 
throwing a grenade into the conversation after people had just settled into this idea of how spectacular Vancouver was to visit. And that's what really turned the corner in my, uh, uh, from what I saw of how this group came to think about Vancouver life and the opportunity. Thank you, Yoti. Okay, I'll finish it. Um, thank you to each of you so much for your contributions and your thoughtfulness. Um, the diversity of thinking is so powerful to me. Um, the clarity in which, Brittany, you, you speak is so valuable. And the, the ability for you all to think at different scales is incredible and inspiring. And I was so impressed by the humility and the generative, the generative, nation of your, generative nature of your dialogue. So thank you for that. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. So there's some food and snacks. Yeah, and there's food and snacks and drinks over there. <laughs> and I, I, lastly, I just want to thank uh, our three <laughs> panelists for coming and your contributions. Uh, I'm glad everybody likes submerged figures uh, at the West. So <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. <laughs>